Well, hello, and uh, it is time for a new unit this summer in uh, 2022. We are going through a study of prayer. And uh, as you saw on the screen, it is prayer that moves heaven. We're going to be looking at a study of prayer from a number of different angles as we go through uh, the course of these 13 lessons. I'll show you a little bit of a breakdown of what that's going to look like in a moment. But uh, as you can see also, uh, the first lesson we're going to be looking at is going to take us to the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. We're going to be looking at chapter 6, verses 17 through 20. I actually want to read the few verses ahead of that because there is a context there that we want to look at and sets into context for us what Paul wants to talk about with regard to prayer. We are going to cover prayer from a number of different angles. I will come to you as a person who is still growing in his own, uh, own understanding and practice of prayer. It is always a lifelong endeavor. And uh, as we get ready to look in a moment at the number of passages that we're going to see and the topics we're going to cover with regard to prayer, you're going to find a number of familiar passages in there, a couple of them that you may not equate with prayer, at least in your own reckoning at first. But then as we get through them, you'll see how much they do help us. When we're done with this study, hopefully we will be motivated to pray more, that we will know what to be praying about, and that we will recognize the ultimate goal of our prayer life is to develop our relationship with God through Jesus and his Holy Spirit. I want to give us a quick overview then of what the lesson is going to look like before we actually go through our lesson. The unit is going to look uh, rather uh, diverse in many ways, but then at the same time, we'll be looking at a number of things that focus in on what we're going to see with regard to different people who have prayed and what they prayed for. So as we get ready to look, you'll see our first lesson that we're going to look at is Battle Ready, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 17 through 20, and that is going to be dealing with prayer in the context of spiritual battles. We'll see that as a conclusion of Paul's discussion of the armor of God. And then without going through all 13 by name, I want you to take a quick moment to look at the number of different topics that we're going to be looking at with regard to persistence and intercession. We're going to be talking about Jesus praying for us, but also teaching about prayer. There are a couple of passages from the Old Testament, namely Nehemiah and Daniel. We'll get to see their prayer life and how that can help us. We'll see again also how God helps us through prayer when we don't know what to pray. We'll see in lesson four, for instance, the Holy Spirit as an intercessor for us. I wanted you to get a quick look at that so that as we go from week to week, you'll be able to recognize what we're going to be looking at and uh, kind of anticipate what we're going to be doing as we move forward. We're going to be looking at, if I can find it here in a second, we're going to be looking at Ephesians. As I said, I want to read that first, and then I want to come back and then show you another screen that gives you the breakdown of the passage as we're going to look at it. Uh, overall, what Paul is saying in this text that I'm about to read for you is about what we do in preparing ourselves for spiritual battle in general. But all of that then get ba gets bathed, if you will, in the matter of prayer. And so we want to talk about that. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Ephesians chapter 6. I want to read verses 10 through 20, and I will be reading from the New International Version 2011 edition. That's going to be the text that we're going to be looking at through this unit. And as always, I will make a point to uh, either comment on different translations by showing some comparisons and contrasts, or being able to go back and give some further clarification on some of the meaning of some of the words or some of the ways that the words are clarified for us so that we can get a better understanding of what's going on there. Let me go ahead and read then Paul's words to the Ephesians in chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Of course, this comes near the, at the end of the letter after he's already been instructing them about who they are in Christ. Uh, what they were like before, what they are like now, what God has done to equip them, and as they are equipping each other for the ministry of developing unity and truth. And now what Paul wants to do is help them prepare for what they need to um, be ready for with regard to attacks from various perspectives. He says this, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness 
that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And then our passage of focus today. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Well, let's go ahead and quickly look back over the text in outline form. We're going to have three main points that we're going to be looking at. And as we do, uh, you'll see it might be a little bit difficult to factor in how verse 17 is going to fit in, but we'll make a point to do that. Again, our lesson is battle ready. First thing we're going to look at is verse six or verse 17, the armor of prayer, really how conclude the discussion of the armor of God that leads into where prayer fits. Then we'll look at verse 18, praying in the spirit. That's not the only thing that is discussed in that passage, but we want to at least cap it off with the idea that this is the main realm in which we would pray. And then there's a specific prayer that Paul is going to ask of the Ephesians that gives them an immediate application to the instructions that he's given them. And it kind of puts in perspective all that we've been we'll be talking about in this text with regard to the idea of boldness and fearlessness, as we'll see moving forward. But let's go ahead and take a quick look then at the text moving forward. So first, the armor of God. One of the things that Paul has been pointing out is that it is important to recognize who the real enemy is. Now, it seems like it's a negative to talk beginning about prayer with the enemy. But the reality is we want to be talking to our Heavenly Father and being in contact with Him because we need to recognize how we are going to make our way through this world. We've been promised by Jesus as he ascended that we have the Holy Spirit in us as believers, and we do. We'll see the role of the Holy Spirit in future lessons as well as we pray. But the point is, it's necessary to have these armaments, if you will, in order to make our way through this world. And so without going through the text again, I just want to point out that what Paul is, is recognizing for us is that while we may deal with physical adversities, we may deal with people, our ultimate enemy is not going to be those people, but as Paul said, the devil himself. And it's interesting that the NIV uses the word schemes of the devil. It really is a Greek word from where we get our actual word methods. So it's rather interesting there. In fact, the, the point is that the devil has a plan to try and stifle the people of God. And what Paul is saying here is that we need to be ready, and God has equipped us with what we need to do that. Admittedly, we don't always take Paul at his uh, advice and at his instruction here, as we've seen in other places in the Bible as well. And as a result, that's where our failure comes in. But Paul wants us to recognize first that we need to understand who is, who is it and what is it that we're fighting against. He says clearly it's not flesh and blood, but it is about the schemes of the devil as also used in using various institutions and even heavenly types of beings. He talks about the heavenly realms there, which is a theme that comes up on occasion through the book of Ephesians, particularly in the first couple of chapters. But what he says is he talks about the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, our feet shod with the readiness to prepare the gospel and preach the gospel. And then, of course, he talks about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We want to look at all of that because each of them plays a part in what we need in order to live our lives daily. One of the things then he concludes with in verse 17 is we're going to call it the armor of prayer. There's a tie in here. I'll show you in a moment. But the armor of prayer, really, verse 17 concludes with two elements of the armor of God. And one is the helmet of salvation, the idea that our salvation, we have that protection with a helmet that keeps us from being harmed in that way. Again, the metaphors that are being used there kind of give us a, a, a kind of a literalistic view of what that armor looks like. Clearly, though, what Paul is doing and drawing not only from Roman armaments or all Roman components of armor, but he's also taking many, many of these components from Isaiah as he has looked through here and pulled these all together, even though Isaiah and other parts of the Old Testament have used this kind of language somewhere else. He's pulled them all together to give us a picture. And then he concludes in verse 17, not only with the helmet of salvation, but the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And it's important to recognize here that the word of God 
is not just talking about the Bible. Okay, we do know that Paul had the Old Testament at this time. He has written this letter, of course, and prior to this, he has written a letter to the Romans. He's written First and Second Corinthians. He's written um, First and Second Thessalonians and Galatians. Uh, he is in the process about the same time writing this letter uh, as writing Colossians and Philemon and Philippians. He is yet to write what we call the pastoral letters. We don't have a New Testament at this point, and that's what I'm trying to say here. When he talks about the Word of God, he's talking along the lines of what Moses would say in the book of Deuteronomy, that man does not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, what God says. It is fortunate for us later, 2,000 years later, to have a complete Bible that we can draw on. And in that regard, when we talk about the Word of God, we can talk about that. There may be room for when God may speak in other ways that we need to be paying attention to. But clearly, there is a reference here to the sword of the Spirit. And there's a parallel there in the writer to the Hebrews when he talks about the, the, the Word of God being a two-edged sword able to cut us and divide us in such a way as to identify who we are, to dissect us, if you will, to help us examine who we are. And that word there is in association with the spirit as well. The key then is that what we need to do in preparing for our daily battle is to be in communication with God. And part of that communication then is going to take place by listening to the word of God. Because what we need to do is not only know about what our salvation is, where our righteousness comes from, and what righteousness means, how we develop our faith and what our faith is in, what the gospel is and how we move through and preach the gospel. All of those things come from our understanding as we read the word of God so that we can then identify that and put those things into action. Of course, our communication with God does not stop with his speaking to us. What Paul goes on to say then in verse 18 is about the notion of praying. All of these things that we have in the armor of God then need to be put together as we communicate with God in prayer. And so Paul is going to bring that in as we move forward. So the tie-in here is that the prayer is something around which we wrap uh, or use the prayer to wrap all these other things in their proper context. So that's what he says. Now, verse 18, the NIV reads this way. Again, I'm going to read that, and then I want to come back and talk about it in the way that it's presented in the original so that you can get a little bit more of an enhancement of what Paul is doing in the way that he says it. The NIV reads this way, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Well, it's a, it's a wonderful way to say it, and I think that there is a lot of meaning behind it, but some of the words have been moved around to kind of put them in a way that we in English might be able to see the progression of thought. The reality is Paul does something to build up to a certain command in here, and then he moves from that to show you how everything fits together. So here's what he says in the way he wrote it to the Ephesians through every prayer and petition. And you might say with the word prayer, every act of prayer, it's not just prayer uh, as a word, but an action. Through every prayer and petition, praying in every time or on every time or occasion in the spirit, and with this in mind, being alert with every perseverance and request, concerning all the saints. Now, let me go through that again, because I want you to pick up on something that's going on here. First, there are two main commands that are being presented in verse 18. One is prayer, is to pray, and then the other is to be alert, or stay awake, or to be on watch. We'll talk about that word moving forward. Now, uh, some will say because those are participles, the idea of praying and keeping alert, that they must be subordinate, or they're supporting the idea of the action of actually uh, taking up the sword of the spirit. And how would you do that? You would do it with prayer. The reality is that there are times when this participle can have its own function as an imperative. And I'm in agreement with a number of other scholars who would say that the way this is worded, while these are participles, they do have the function of being imperatives. In other words, what Paul is doing here is by way of an imperative or by way of a participle, he's giving us a command. What he's doing, though, is he builds up to that. So first, he tells us the means by which we are to do this. And he uses a, the noun and the participle for the word prayer there. 
through every act of prayer and petition or request. And I word it that way because of this. Most of your translations are going to say on all occasions or all kinds of prayers, things like that. The reality of the word, the, the reality of the fact is the word is singular. Now that may sound like it's limiting, but in reality, by using the word every, it means that it can be particularized. Now, what does that mean? If we think of all prayers of all kinds or all occasions, we may not think definitively enough. We would just speak in generic terms about just always. But what Paul is doing here is he's using an, in a singular form here so that he helps us to remember that it's every instance, every moment, every type of situation. So through every act of prayer and petition, those words are put together, through every act of prayer and petition, pray. The idea there is keep on praying, continually pray. So the idea there is he uses this cognate idea. In other words, he uses the noun and the verbal idea from the same stem to emphasize the point. He does add the synonym there for request or petition, and they'll see that word in a moment, to kind of enhance what he's doing there. But the point is that there's prayer in general, and then there are, along with prayers in general, specific types of things in prayer. Here he talks about requests. In other words, he's making, he's in, inviting us and commanding us to make petition. And that's going to be important because as we go through all 13 lessons, we're going to be looking at prayer in general and different kinds of prayers and on what occasions and so forth. But what Paul is doing here is he's particularizing. He's saying in every act of prayer, on every request, pray. And then he furthers that by saying, on or in every time. The word is literally time or occasion, special occasion or special emphasis. And again, I know other translations are going to make that plural and say on all occasions, but I just think that doesn't give us the, the sense of how honed in Paul can be at this point by identifying every occasion so that we're not thinking just in general, but that we're thinking with each moment, with each time span, with each occurrence, we should be praying. He says in every occasion, every time. And then he says, the last thing he says in this part of the verse is that that prayer should be in the spirit. Now, there's a lot of discussion about what praying in the spirit is. Some would suggest that that means praying in tongues. Others would say that there's some kind of other special kind of spiritual conversation that's going on. I think what Paul is doing here is recognizing that if our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual powers, then we do need the help of the Holy Spirit. And that word in could mean by means of praying in the Spirit or praying by the Spirit. And it could also be that he's talking about in the spiritual realm, not just in the Holy Spirit. Most of your translations are going to use the phrase Spirit as a capital letter. And I think that's legitimate. The way the phrase is being used there in pneumity uh, can mean in the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit. If that's the case, then there's a sense in which Paul is saying we need to be accessing our help from the Holy Spirit. He doesn't go on to talk about what that's going to look like in terms of whether that's going to be your native language speaking, or if it's going to be some kind of prayer language or speaking in tongues. He doesn't say that, and I'm not going to push back against that. All I'm going to say is Paul doesn't define what praying in the Spirit is, and therefore we need to be cautious. He does say that we would pray in the realm of the Spirit or within the context of the Holy Spirit, which means what? With all that we have with regard to the armor of God, we need help. We need communication. If it is a spiritual battle, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So that prayer should take place in the realm of the Spirit. It doesn't mean we wouldn't use our native language to pray. It just means that we know that we're praying to the Father and we're going to be communicating with him. Now, what we're going to see in a future lesson is that there are times when the Holy Spirit will do more than just be there for us, but will actually help us to pray, not just the realm or the environment in which we pray, but the Holy Spirit actually doing that for us. What's important, though, is that Paul is telling us that as we endeavor in this life, as we go day by day, we need to recognize that with every act of prayer, with every petition, on every occasion, we should be praying. We should constantly be praying. We need to have constant communication with God. We're getting communication with God from his word. We'll get communication from God through his people as they would speak to us. 
uh, as God would lead them to do that, and we recognize that God can do that. Of course, we do recognize God will speak to us directly as well, but the point is that there needs to be communication back and forth. In this instance, Paul talks about prayer generically, and then he talks specifically about requests. Moving further into the verse, he says there's one other thing that needs to be done, and that is not just praying, but being alert. He says, uh, unto itself, or with this in mind, in other words, with the idea of praying on all occasions in the spirit, that means that we would, be, would need to be alert. He says, being alert, or as many of your translations are going to do, turn that into an imperative, into a command, be alert. The idea is stay awake, be on watch. It's again, a participle like the word praying with the force of an imperative, pray and watch. Again, since he's using the metaphor of the armor of God, he's talking about a soldier. And what would be the role of a soldier? It would be on watch, be careful, looking out for the enemy. We have that spiritual enemy we constantly need to be on the lookout for. That requires being prayerful and being watchful. Notice then what Paul says after he says being alert. He says in or with every perseverance. Uh, the idea is continually, perpetuating, persistently in every perseverance and request. And that word request there is the same word that was given a moment ago earlier in the verse with the idea of a petition. Being alert with every petition, being alert, constantly being persevering. So it's an act of perseverance, being alert with every act of perseverance. Now, what the NIV does there with the idea of every act of perseverance and request says, always keep on praying. And again, the idea is persistence. The word there literally is persistence. What the NIV has done is gone ahead and kind of clean that up, if you will, smooth that out to talk about every act of prayer or always keep on praying. Uh, I know it's a little bit awkward to use the phrase I just did, but I think to get that word in, helps us to see what Paul is communicating with all the other information he's given us. When he talks about on all occasions or in every occasion, on every occasion or in every circumstance, here he parallels that here in the second part of the verse with in every act of perseverance. So clearly what Paul is talking about is this idea of spiritual warfare requires not only the various aspects of the armor of God, but it requires to be continually prayerful. That comes from the participle or the idea of praying in the early part of verse 18. And then it comes out clearly, again, with the idea of every act or every moment of perseverance and with each request, every perseverance, every request. Again, the same word that is used earlier. But here's what I want us to see, that this is now the fourth time he's used the word for every some of your, again, your translations will say all. So every act of prayer and petition in every situation or occasion, in every act of perseverance and request. Then he goes on to say, concerning all the saints. Now, we're being alert. And the idea of being alert there is important because this is the same word that is used in the Olivet Discourse in Mark 13 and Luke 21, when, when Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says to continually be alert. You do not know the hour when the Son of Man will come. The point there is always be on watch. Paul has been using that same idea here. But then when he talks about praying and being alert, he's then talking about the idea is when we focus on all the saints. Here he does use the plural, concerning all the saints. Now, the NIV says Lord's people, probably to avoid the idea of misunderstanding of what the word saints means. Paul has no problem using the word hagioi or holy ones or the word for saints. Uh, in referring to all believers in Christ. And as a result, I want to do that as well. He says, concerning all the saints. So that means what? If all the believers are praying for all the saints, we're praying for each other. And so he's talking about, notice how inclusive the language is here while it's also being particular. On every occasion or with every act of prayer and petition, in every situation with all perseverance or every act of perseverance and request, praying and being alert concerning all the saints. And one of the things he's saying here then, and he's about to make a personal application, is that part of our warfare and spiritual warfare is not only protecting ourselves individually, but praying on behalf of others as well. We'll have another lesson in the future about praying for others specifically, but one of the things that Paul is pointing out here is that the spiritual battle is not individual, and that's pointed out in the way that he's given instruction uh, but also the fact is that he's given us a concern here that we would be concerned for all the saints. 
So we have this idea then of praying and being alert. Then in verses 19 through 20, he talks specifically about himself. He makes a prayer request as he has now enjoined them to be praying for all the saints. As one of the saints himself, he's going to be asking for prayer. And it's an interesting concept given what we know about Paul. And yet it's also not surprising given what we know about Paul. Let's read verses 19 to 20 and bring in some relevant points here. He says, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Now, the NIV does a good job here of clarifying some things. The one thing that's being clarified here is that nowhere in this verse or these two verses is the word prayer ever used. It's implied from the previous verse. The, the, the way the, the wording is done in the original from verses 18 through 20 is that's one continuous description or one continuous sentence that you have carrying over. So when he talks about praying for all the saints, he follows that up with, and for me. Most modern translations are going to kind of make those sentences shorter and then bring in the word that's being used before so they can carry on the conversation. But he literally says praying concerning all the saints and for me. Then he particularizes it. He makes it more specific. With that in mind, that's why many of your translations are going to go ahead and start a new sentence, even while we have the new verse numbers. So it is important to recognize that in his teaching about prayer, he now gives them an opportunity to pray specifically. And what he does is he idea, the idea is in moving from praying for all the saints now for himself, he identifies what specific prayer requests he has and for what purposes he's asking for prayer. So while the word prayer or praying is not in the text at this point, it's implied, it's a carryover from what he's been saying. Notice that he's being very specific in his prayer request. He says, pray also for me that the word would be given to me in the opening of my mouth or whenever I open my mouth. Literally, it's in the opening of my mouth. So his prayer is that when he gets ready to speak, it would be given to him. In other words, the word would be given to him what he should say. It's interesting that when you read what Jesus has to say to his disciples as he sends them out on a missionary journey during the middle of his ministry, he says, don't worry about what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit will give you the words you need to say. Paul now is making that prayer request from the people that he's writing to in Ephesus. He's saying, pray that the word would be given to me whenever I open my mouth. Now, more specific than that, the purpose for being able to be given the words to say is the purpose for which he's going to speak. So the first is the prayer request. Pray that I will receive the word I need, that the word would be given to me when I open my mouth. And that word there, be given to me, is the idea of a passive idea that ultimately it's that God would give him the words. It's not stated explicitly or specifically that's the case, but the way the wording is in the New Testament a lot of times with that passive idea, when there's not an agent expressed, it's generally understood that it's God giving him, that it would be, it would be God doing the work. So when he says this, it would be something like this, pray for me also that God would give me the words to speak whenever I open my mouth. Now, that's implied from the way the wording is. He simply says that the word would be given to me whenever I open my mouth. But he's not just saying that for every occasion. He's saying specifically for the purpose of the next thing, to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now, he has written about the mystery in the letter to the Ephesians. He's referenced that language in other places. And clearly what he means by mystery is specified in the book of Ephesians is the idea that God is now making known that gospel is being revealed to the Gentiles that has been concealed in the past. Mystery is not something that we are enjoined to solve. It is something that can only be revealed. And so what Paul is saying is that God has now given him the ministry of relief, revealing that mystery. And he's been doing that through his various missionary journeys. He's in prison now. He's been through three missionary journeys up to this point. What he has done from place to place is spoken the gospel to the Jews first. Many of them believed, many of them didn't. When they rejected, he went on to the Gentiles. And therefore, he is one of God's representatives. He's going to use the word ambassador here in a moment. 
he has been God's rep representative to reveal the mystery that the gospel is being presented to the Gentiles. So he is praying that the word be given to him, that he will speak the mystery of the gospel whenever he opens his mouth. Now, it's not just what he's going to be preaching, what he's going to be speaking, but the manner in which he is going to be speaking. And he says in this case that he would do it with boldness, with confidence. The NIV says fearlessly, and I get that, but the word is not related at all with the word fear and then the negative of fear. It's actually the word confidence, boldness. It's the idea that's used uh, in a number of places in the New Testament. One of these is, for instance, when the writer of the Hebrews says, because of the work of Jesus on the cross, we can come boldly to the throne of God with confidence is the idea. So that he can speak boldly. And I want to pick up on that word here in a moment, because it is a word that is used in such a way, at least the cognate of this word is used in a number of places that spe speak specifically of what Paul does throughout his missionary journey. It's interesting that he's making this prayer request because he has been doing this up to this point. Now, he is in chains. He is in prison at this point for speaking the gospel. And maybe part of the reason for the prayer request is that he does not lose heart, given the fact that he is in prison. Well, he says that he wants not only to have the words to speak when he opens his mouth, that they would be given to him. The main focus is to preach the gospel and to do it boldly, with boldness, with confidence. If the NIV is going to go with the word fearlessly, that's fine. The point is very boldly. In other words, pushing fear away, if anything. Then when he talks about the gospel, he identifies this gospel as that for which he is an ambassador in chains. He uses the word ambassador to describe himself. In 2 Corinthians, he talks about being ambassadors for Christ. We are representatives in another land for the kingdom of God. He is doing that. He happens to be one who is in chains. All right. Again, he's not making a specific request, or I should say it this way. The words for prayer are not stated, even though in verse 20, he goes on to continue the wording in the NIV, but it's understood. The, the goal then is to preach the gospel, and then also so that in the preaching of the gospel, literally says in it, in the act of preaching, when he preaches the gospel, again, the idea of speaking boldly will come out. Again, the word says fearless. I may be fearless in preaching the gospel. In fact, as we go back and read verse 20 there, he says, for which I'm ambassadors, pray that I may declare it fearlessly. The idea of declare it fearlessly is all one word. In other words, boldly speak, okay? He says, pray that I may speak it boldly. This particular word of speaking boldly, it's a compound word for the word bold <laughs> and speaking. And that particular word occurs nine times in the New Testament. We've just read one. But on the other eight occasions, out of those eight occasions, seven of them are specifically used with regard to describing Paul's act of speaking. On a couple of those occasions, it's with Barnabas. One of the occasions is with Apollos. Let me give you a quick rundown here, because the point that I want to make is that Paul is going to be asking them, the Ephesians, to pray that he be bold in his speaking, that he'd be able to speak boldly, but it's something he's always been doing. So after his conversion on the road to Damascus, he gets to Damascus, and in Acts 9, verses 27 to 28, we're told that he preaches in Damascus, and he does so boldly. The word there is he spoke boldly the word of God, or he spoke boldly the gospel. Both times in verses 27 and 28, we see that word. Later on in the first missionary journey, uh, Paul and Barnabas make it to Antioch, and we're told in Acts 13, 46, that they spoke the word boldly. Continuing on in Acts 14, verse 3, on that same first missionary journey, they're in Iconium, and it again says they spoke the word boldly, this exact same word. Later on in verse 18, or excuse me, Acts 18, verses, or verse 26, we do see this occasion. This is Apollos, who is from Alexandria. He's in Ephesus already, and he is speaking boldly. The problem is he's speaking incompletely. When Priscilla and Aquila encounter him, they recognize that he's speaking truth, but he's speaking incomplete truth. And therefore, they teach him and they disciple him to, to know the truth more fully. And of course, then he goes on to be a famed rhetorician 
for the gospel, but we have this one occasion where the word is used of Apollos. We get back to Paul in Acts chapter 19, verse 8, shortly after what occurred in Ephesus with Apollos and Priscilla and Aquila. Paul shows up, and it's during this third missionary journey while he's at Ephesus that he speaks the word boldly, and we're told there he does so on uh, the um, account of three different, or uh, three months worth of speaking. And we're going to come back to another text in Acts in a moment, but to keep chronologically in order here, I want to take us to uh, chapter, or excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, where Paul writes about his experience in sharing the gospel with the Thessalonians, and that occurs during that third missionary journey as well, and he says that he spoke boldly with them. Then when we get back to Acts, in Acts 26, 26, he's already been taken captive by the Jews, he's being held by the Romans in Caesarea, and he has already spoken before Felix, and now he's speaking before Festus, and now Agrippa, and while he's speaking his testimony to Agrippa, Festus interrupts him, and in Paul's response to Festus interrupting him, he talks about how he was speaking boldly and confidently before Agrippa. This is while he was in Caesarea. Now, in the writing to the Ephesians, he's in a Roman prison, and he is using this word again. I find it interesting that what we can tell from the way Luke portrays Paul's life in the book of Luke, or the book of Acts, he has been speaking boldly. This has been his trend. But notice, even though it's something that he's been doing all along, he asks prayer that he continue to do that. He doesn't seem to show any signs of giving up on that. In fact, when you read his letter to the Philippians, which is written around the same time, he's very confident uh, and bold in his proclamation of the gospel, because even the people that are there keeping him in prison are hearing the gospel. But I think it's interesting that he goes on to say that I, he's praying that they would give, that he would continue to have more boldness. So he's asking the Ephesians, while they recognize he's in prison, that he be emboldened to continue to preach the word. And then the very last thing he says in that text, he says it this way, that I may continue to speak fearlessly as it is necessary for me to speak. Uh, some translations like the NIV says, as I should. Uh, I think there's more to it than that. Uh, this is the idea, again, of some divine appointment that God has given Paul, that it is, it is, it is his mission to be preaching the gospel. He says, help me to be bold in my preaching as it is necessary for me to speak. He literally says, it is necessary for me to speak. So it's his calling. Yet, while he's demonstrated that evidence, or he has evidenced that attitude of preaching boldly, he's asking for prayer. Paul knew his own circumstances required prayer. His endeavor to preach the gospel would be met with opposition and has been on occasion, would be again, and there would be temptations on his part to shrink back. Imagine that. The Apostle Paul, after exhibiting all of this boldness in preaching the gospel, would be concerned about it. Maybe he's recognized the value of other people praying for him while he was about going about his missionary journeys. And we'll see some other places where he talks about interceding for others and asking for intercession in other places. We'll see that in other texts before and, and other texts later. But it's interesting. Paul is concerned that he continually be fearless, that he continually be bold in his proclamation of the gospel. He had just given them the description of the armor they needed to stand, and now he was asking for their prayers so that he could also stand, so that he could stay strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So in this brief lesson, what we've seen is Paul giving us instruction that along with all the necessities of our knowledge, what we need to have in terms of recognizing uh, what the truth is, what the gospel entails, that we have salvation, that we continue to grow in our faith and become more righteous. We need to speak through the help of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, and then all of that needs to be wrapped in prayer. The Christian life requires prayer. It's important that we be in communion with God, and what Paul is saying here is as we begin thinking about prayer in every situation, on every occasion, with every request, for all the saints. He even then gives an illustration to the, uh, the Ephesians that they can do their part to include him in prayer so that he can continue to be bold. 
Well, we have an introduction then to our study, just the idea that prayer should be a very important part of our walk daily. It should be a part of who we are as we walk and live alertly so that we can be prepared for everything that the world and the devil and spiritual realms may have against us. Paul has said we have the equipping. Now we have to put it in practice. This is a start, but it's a good start. What we're going to do as we look at the rest of these texts throughout the course of these lessons is to look at different aspects of prayer, what should be the focus of prayer, how we get help in prayer, and moving forward to help us continually to be persistent in prayer. And certainly, as this lesson has indicated, that our lives should be, should be pervasive in prayer. We need prayer every day. We need to be praying for ourselves. We need to be praying for others. Paul, dem Paul identifies for us how all pervasive the need of prayer in our lives is. If it's a spiritual battle, we need spiritual equipping, and that means a spiritual connection with our Heavenly Father. This is a start to our study of prayer. Let's end with prayer, and then we'll look at our next lesson coming up. Father, we know that uh, it is important for us to be in communication with you. You have given us your spirit to indwell us, you are making us daily in the image of your son, Jesus. And we know that you have called us to be in communion with you. And that means communication with you. You have spoken to us through Jesus. And you have spoken to us through your written word. We know that there are ways and mysteries in which you will speak to us by way of your spirit. I just pray, Father, you help us to develop our communication with you. Help us in these lessons moving forward to look at examples of prayer, to know that we can draw uh, from your word on how to pray, that we can draw on your word the words that we need to pray. And Father, that as we read your word, we know it's necessary for us to understand what it is you're having us to apply in our lives. And Lord, we do pray you forgive us because we don't pray as often as we should. And though you may not judge in terms of the content, we know that we don't often pray as well as we should. Open our hearts and our minds to hearing your word as it speaks to us through these next 13 lessons on prayer, to be in communion with you and communication with you. We thank you that you've given us the example of your son who prayed, knowing his need of prayer and communication with you. We're thankful that you've given us your spirit, who also will intercede on our behalf at times when we don't know the words to say. I just pray, Father, you will open our hearts and minds to be ready to receive what you have to teach us on the matter of prayer. And then more importantly, or as importantly, that we would be prayers, that we would be those who are in communication with you on a regular basis. We love you and praise you. We want to worship you. We ask for your guidance and direction. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our next lesson coming up is going to be looking at Thessalonians. And as we get ready to do this, we're going to see uh, already a discussion about praying for others. We've seen an example of Paul asking for prayer for himself at this point, but clearly what he's going to do in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, is he's going to give us further information about what it means to be in prayer for other people. So I would encourage you to go ahead and read that text before we meet again. It's a short text. That doesn't mean it's going to be a short lesson. If you've been around long enough, you know that I can take a short text and make it a long lesson. Hopefully it's a meaningful endeavor and not just something to take up time. I do pray that as you go about your work this week, or however long it is between the times you view these lessons, uh, that you will continually persist in prayer, that you will enjoy the fellowship of the brothers and sisters in Christ, that you will be seeking out God in all things for your life. And as always, it is my prayer that you'll be well and that you'll be blessed.